So today's event focuses on a critically important issue, the racial impact of the U.S. Supreme Court's Dobbs decision on women in the United States and beyond, really on women around the globe. Earlier this year, as you all know, the U.S. Supreme Court, in its landmark decision, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, revoked the constitutional right to an abortion, reversing a 50-year-old precedent that, established, that was established in the case of Roe v. Wade. The Dobbs decision stripped women and persons capable of becoming pregnant of their right to health, bodily autonomy, dignity, and potentially the right to life itself. Fundamentally, the right to an abortion is an essential component of comprehensive women's health care. Reproductive rights, including the right to contraception and abortion, are also central to women's freedom to participate on equal terms in the workplace and uh, to women's economic rights. Now, future access to this essential health care and economic right will be severely limited or denied in more than half the states in the U.S. and beyond. Make no mistake, the Dobbs decision will have particularly devastating consequences for black and brown people in the United States who have already experienced structural racism and unequal access to health care, including to reproductive health care. Black maternal mortality is a particularly shocking and ongoing tragedy in our country. In the U.S. today, black women are three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause than white women. Dobbs will further deepen existing inequalities in sexual and reproductive health for women of color in the United States. The New England Journal of Medicine recently reported that a nationwide ban on abortion would increase maternal mortality by 21% overall and by 31% among black Americans. The repercussions of the Dobbs decision extend well beyond our borders. The decision will affect funding of sexual reproductive health rights in countries around the world where women depend upon U.S. organizations and agencies for access to life-saving services. Our esteemed panel today will address the diverse racial impacts of Dobbs in historical, national, and global context. We could not be more fortunate to host these three speakers today. Our esteemed panelists are globally recognized scholars and leaders working at the forefront of global reproductive justice, whose work has specifically focused on the disparate racial impacts of reproductive rights. We are honored first to welcome the United States Rapporteur on Health, Dr. Kleleng uh, Mofokeng. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great honor to have you. <laughs> Dr. Kleleng Mofokeng also known affectionately to the public around the world as Dr. T, has as her mandate to attain the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health for human beings everywhere, regardless of gender, nationality, ethnicity, tribal identity, sexual orientation, or wealth. Dr. Mofa Kang is a practicing medical doctor. She is the first woman, the first person of color, and the first African to hold the position of UN Rapporteur on Health. And her leadership comes at a critical moment, as Dr. Mofa King's work has long centered maternal mortality and reproductive freedom and health for women and girls. Joining Dr. Mofa King is the incredible Professor Michelle Goodwin. Michelle Goodwin <laughs> is, she is Chancellor's Professor of Law at UC Irvine and a leading scholar in health law. In fact, she's a founder of the field of health law and a scholar of race and bioethics. Our uh, panel, panel moderator, Sasha, uh, Sarah Basha, will be giving uh, fuller biographies of our speakers, but let me just say that Georgetown Law is incredibly fortunate to have Professor Goodwin, a champion of reproductive justice and its intersections with race. Uh, she is also a generous teacher and mentor. We're so fortunate that she has been here as a visiting professor with us this term. Finally, we are also so pleased to welcome Dr. Katherine Burns, Associate Professor of Medical History at the University of Witzwatersen, South Africa. And before I say uh, something more briefly about Dr. Burns, let me just first note that this is an important conversation today because it is also taking place on the heels of the launch this past Friday, just 
two days ago of a historic new commission on racism, structural discrimination, and global health that is being led by our very own O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health in partnership with the journal Lancet. The commission is co-chaired by Dr. Mofakang, uh, who is also, we are proud to say, a distinguished lecturer here at our O'Neill Institute, and by Dr. Ngozi Arandu, who is right here in the front row. <laughs> Dr. Arandu is a senior scholar at the O'Neill Institute, and she's an epidemiologist by training as well. So this commission is embarking on a bold and timely undertaking to address racism and structural inequity as it relates to health equity in a global context. To that end, uh, I did have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Mofakang and Dr. Burns at the official launch, or at least I guess it was the official soft launch. We're going to keep launching. Uh, we need to spread the word. Uh, but at the live stream uh, launch, as they spoke, in New York City on Friday, and I and everyone who heard them found their words to be tremendously moving and inspiring. I'm so delighted they're here, along with our own Professor Goodwin, to share their insights with our community today in pursuit of the goal of the Commission on Racism to accurately diagnose the problem of racism in global health. Today's conversation will present a clear picture of the historical and continuing prevalence of racism in reproductive health care settings in the U.S. and globally. Equally important um, uh, from our stellar panel of experts today and through the lens of the Dobbs decision, you will learn about tools and strategies available in international human rights law and in domestic law that are available to activists, lawyers, scholars, and political leaders working to mitigate and to end racism in healthcare settings. Georgetown Law is so incredibly proud to support this important work. It is now my pleasure to invite Sarah Basha, she is the Director of Health Law Programs here at O'Neill. And Director Basha will be moderating today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Sander, for such a warm welcome, um, for such a generous welcome of this esteemed panel of wonderful women to talk about something very important and very timely. I'm just going to highlight just a few more things. There isn't much to add to what Dean Sander has already said about these women. Uh, but for Dr. Tlaleng Mofokeng, just to highlight that, you know, she is chairing this uh, important commission. But in addition to that, she's a widely read author and an intersectional activist. And she is using her voice as an activist, as a scholar, as a medical doctor, to be able to really give a voice to the voices and to be a powerful advocate for those that normally would not have the power to, to speak for themselves. And a little bit more on Professor Michelle Goodwin. She's the recipient of the 2020 to 2021 Distinguished Senior Faculty Award for Research. And she's also the first law professor at the University of California, Irvine, to receive this award. So congrats to you. She also... Yes. She also directed the first ABA accredited health law program. So in a way, she's the godmother of health law, right, in the U.S., <laughs> among the founders. And then also just a little bit about Professor Catherine Burns. Um, something that maybe uh, you may not know, Professor Burns and uh, Dr. T have a special relationship. Professor Burns was a mentor to Dr. Is a mentor to Dr. T, was the first person that opened up her eyes to the impact of racism and the importance of history in addressing where we are today in healthcare. And yeah, we might say was inspirational in some ways, right? Into to the person that we have now. She was her teacher at school. So we're seeing how generational knowledge is passed on for change, and this is the sort of thing that we need to continue to do and to foster. Um, so I just want to get right into it because, you know, there isn't much time, and I want to start right with Dobbs. Dr. T, you are the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So why did you think it important for you and others to submit an amicus? I think you know, it's for a national case of national interest, but why did you feel you had to lend your voice into support to women here in the U.S.? Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you for that introduction. And hi, everyone. I see familiar faces from all the Zoom meetings, so it feels really great um, to be here in person. And I just want to say that we know that many, um, you know, other courts around the world draw on each other's judgments for jurisprudence. 
And of course, the US Supreme Court is such a court that many others um, draw from. It's important as well because the US, um, you know, as a self-defined superpower, um, you know, has a lot of influence in foreign policy, not just of the US, but of other nations as well. But also foreign policy often guides spending. And global health aid, unfortunately, still depends very much on foreign health funding. And so we know with the global gag rule, a unilateral uh, power that a president has to enforce restrictions on abortion advocacy, information giving, clinical care, and policy change around it, how it has already fractured um, and disseminated any you know, uh, primary health care uh, services around abortion, especially on the Africa continent. It was important to then, like my legal team, when we had the briefing call, I did say I want to set the record straight, but I didn't know that that would go into the brief. So in the brief, it reads that the UN, Dr. Tlaile Mufugeng, wants to set the record straight <laughs> to the court. And in retrospect, I think, yeah, that was actually a good decision, um, simply because abortion is health care. Abortion saves lives. And I say that as a proud abortion provider. And I've seen how when people are asking for an abortion, it's not just about a clinical service. It's about a right to self-determination, autonomy, bodily integrity. But importantly, the right to health is an inclusive right that recognizes key principles of non-discrimination, equality as well. And so when you look at the court judgment and its disproportionate impact on black people, indigenous women, minorities, migrant people, people who are sex workers, non-binary people, then you can see why I was personally as a SR on, on the right to health, um, found it important to then submit this amicus to set their record straight. <laughs> Whether or not they read it, we don't know. But um, it, it was really important to articulate that, Sarah, and also to support a lot of the advocacy that's happening on the ground. I know as a South African that civil society participation and activism and advocacy often gets us where we need to get to in terms of health justice. And we have this history of HIV in our own country. And it's that knowledge that my work is not just this technical UN work, but it directly has to have impact and support that advocacy that's happening on the ground. And that amicus was done in that way. Um, we, we, we knew where the direction could go possibly. We we're still very much shocked when the reality of that actually happened. Um, and so that's why it's that it is a right to health. It is a right... Um, of everyone to determine for themselves if they want to stay pregnant, if they want to get pregnant at all. And of course, the intersections of gender-based violence. We know the intersection of um, early child marriage. So there is a lot there that can be linked um, to the right to health and why having a safe abortion in itself is an important right to have. And to call on the United States to ratify the right to health, that's a campaign I can fully get behind. Um, at the Capitol, we need senators to really uh, ensure that the right to health is ratified in its entirety and not through you know, uh, violence against women or ending discrimination. In that way, we are able to then use the right to health framework to then hold the government accountable in terms of accessibility, affordability, acceptability and quality care. Right now, we can't because they actually do not fully recognize the right to health as an, its own independent right. Thank you for that response. And just thinking through just the frame of human rights, the very principles that underpin human rights, equality, non-discrimination. And I'll move to you, Professor Goodwin. Is there equality in access to SRHR? Has there always been equality in access to SRHR in the US? And what do you think Dobbs does to what we've already known and always known about abortion access rights? Well, first, I want to thank you very much for this convening <clears throat> and my colleagues here. It's a pleasure to be with you and for all of you here. And thank you to Dean for that wonderful and warm introduction. So the reality is that Roe v. Wade was not a North Star. It was a very important uh, decision. 1973, it's worth getting the facts right. Uh, Maria Ressa, who recently, not this year, but last year, was a Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner and journalist. You notice last year there was the recognition of journalists. And I think that was important about how important the rule of law is to how we can communicate out. And one of the things that she said at this past year's American Society of International Law meeting was that one of the most troubling aspects about where we are with regard to democracy and the rule of law is that there are the competing facts, the sort of disagreement on facts. So I want to start maybe with just helping to understand the facts because the rhetoric that we hear today is such that 
abortion was polarized, that it always was, and that for the last 50 years, there's been the Republican Party trying to get rid of abortion. That's just not accurate. Roe v. Wade was a 7-2 to two opinion. Five of the seven justices were Republican appointed. Justice Blackman, who wrote the opinion in Roe, was put on the court by Richard Nixon. Prescott Bush, the father of George H.W. Bush, was the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. Title X, which provides reproductive health care to the poorest of Americans, was shepherded through Congress by George H.W. Bush. And when Title X made its way through, this is when we hear about reproductive health care, such as access to contraception, ovarian screenings, breast cancer screenings, et cetera, that's what Title X paid for. Richard Nixon himself said in interviews, this is basic public health, basic public health. So we've gone from a time in which there was an understanding of basic public health to something that has become very distorted. I also like to remind people, too, that in 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. received an award from Planned Parenthood, its Humanitarian of the Year Award, and rather than running the other way, he ran towards it. Uh, it was his wife who actually received the award on his behalf that evening. I sometimes say he was off being arrested someplace. Uh, it was an evening that she said she was the proudest that she had ever been being a woman. And to make clear that Dr. King wanted people to know that those were his words that she happened to present for him, he wrote to Planned Parenthood afterwards saying, and by the way, just know those were my words when I said it was cruel for a woman to be forced into motherhood. My words when I said it was cruel for children to be born into families that could not afford to sustain them and where they were not wanted. His words when he said that it was absolutely untenable that women could go from agrarian economies where they would have 10 kids and into urban tenements where they would live into, in one bedroom or two bedrooms. Really profound and provocative words from Dr. King. But more specifically, then to your point, shortly after Roe v. Wade, there was the slippage of true access to abortion rights for the poorest of Americans, and amongst them, women of color, because of the Hyde Amendment and internationally, the Helms Amendment. And I think that in this space, as we critique you know, the dismantling of Roe v. Wade, we also have to be mindful, too, about the fact that within the movements for reproductive rights, there wasn't the um, attention that there should have been to socioeconomic uh, inequalities, the failure to account for the lives that women of color were leading, the failure to account for the fact that reproductive rights is a plural, not just a right, such that then we could understand and think about the whole life journey of people and what they need in terms of independence and autonomy in order to be able to live lives that are flourishing. So I think while it's important to recognize what Roe meant, it's also important to understand how it still was a dream deferred for many women of color who could not afford to attain that level of health care. And the last point that I'll make, and thank you so much, is that much will be said, and we may talk about it in terms of the prospect of criminalizing um, access to abortion now that, that people may be criminally policed and civilly policed. The reality is that that was already happening. And it was the failure to pay attention to the lives of poor women, especially black and brown women, the failure to see that there were black women being dragged out of hospitals in shackles and chains when they wanted to be pregnant and when they had disclosed what they thought they could to their doctors and that their doctors would render them the help that they needed. So I think there's so much for us to think about and to talk about within this space and how we get it right the next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And you know, and your remark about setting the record straight, like what does history really say? What are the facts? It, it leads me nicely into asking Professor Birds, what has been the facts around access to sexual reproductive health rights globally when we look at it from a racialized perspective. What's the historical narrative, the facts that we need as a baseline? What an august company to be in. Thank you so much for your invitation and warm welcome. And thank you all for allowing a historian into the room. 
Can I take the baton from you, Michelle? 50 years before that fateful evening when Dr. King was awarded uh, an honor by Planned Parenthood that his wife appeared on his behalf to receive, in 1916, in the city of Baltimore, at the medical school known as the Johns Hopkins University, the first chair of gynecology and obstetrics in the United States, Howard Kelly, um, was beginning his august professorship. I first read about Dr. Kelly, Professor Kelly, when I was an undergraduate student in history in Johannesburg, South Africa, trying to understand why obstetric violence was so obviously a part of the experience of racial oppression in the country. I was trying to find an international community of people such as yourselves, but this was, you know, 40 years ago, who could help me to understand the link between the uh, lack of value on the lives of women in South Africa, of the majority community, and the diminution of the life chances of children born to black mothers and the huge disparity with women who were in the minority community that I was born into. And it was absolutely clear to me and other people such as Kosi Klaba, Barbara Klugman, people involved in the underground movement that supported women's uh, reproductive and sexual rights, that there was this disparity, but there was very little written about this and it was very difficult to assemble data that was convincing. Even many of our comrades in the struggle, including activist doctors, would find it very difficult to pause, as they saw it, on the long struggle towards racial equality, to pay attention to the particular instances of cruelty and barbarism and the way in which medicine as a structure in society was playing a role. Because for many people, medicine and becoming a nurse or a health worker was obviously a noble calling. People swore an allegiance to the Hippocratic Oath and doctors who were overt in their racial discrimination were beginning to be chastised before the courts, if you can believe it, even in apartheid South Africa. But to insist upon the focus on sexual and reproductive rights and on the bodies and on the shoulders of women of, of the majority, women of African descent, was considered a distraction, even some kind of a counter-revolutionary act. So it was with that kind of swirling set of feelings, being part of an underground pro-abortion movement and access to sexual freedom movement, that I was lucky enough to win a scholarship to come to the United States. And I arrived um, in Baltimore in 1988 in the middle of a, of a heat wave, and I made my way to the downtown archives because I was waiting for the university to open. I had to leave South Africa early because of some political reasons. So I was there a month before classes started. And I found that the archives in the inner city, the waterfront, hadn't been developed yet into a kind of glass uh, shining capitalist uh, welcoming shopping space. <laughs> I found that the archives had the letters and the personal documents, the archives of Howard Kelly. I remember when I began opening up those boxes. Then I wrote a letter two weeks later to Professor Elizabeth Fee at Hopkins and asked her to be my supervisor for a project. She went on to become the head of the American Library of Medicine. She said, no one has ever opened Howard Kelly's boxes before. I said, what I find in here it helps me to understand a lot of what's been happening in South Africa. In his lifetime, he was one of the most famous obstetrician gynecologists globally. He developed a special technique to assist with the uh, a reconstruction surgically of women's post-birth traumatic birth injuries, vaginal fistula and other complications. All of his research between 1890 and 1940 was done on the bodies of people of slave descent in the city of Baltimore. He kept meticulous records about this. Therefore, it was no surprise to me a few years ago to read The Secret Life of Henrietta Lacks. What was surprising was to try and understand as a young scholar from South Africa who didn't know a lot about American history then, but I made it my business to learn, <laughs> that there were these multiple intersections around his intellect and his approach. And this is what I'm going to use to respond to the questions. And I hope 
to explain how connected we all are in this struggle. He was of Irish descent, and he was a professing Roman Catholic. He was from a community in Baltimore that had recently been disparaged himself, and his parents were migrants to this country who came from poor peasant communities in Ireland. He was very keen on passing as part of the Anglo elite. He made enormous efforts to eradicate and to, in fact, forestall any critique of himself as a Catholic and as an Irishman. He carried a huge burden in that self-representation. And what he was doing most of his adult life was to constantly work in a defensive position against that. So his line of attack was against all other recent immigrants, particularly people from Southern Europe, including Catholics. And he made it his business to also articulate a very strong anti-black and also anti-Jewish disposition. He helped to found, in 1916, an anti-immigration league to close the door behind him and people like him. In the time that he was professor of gynecology and obstetrics, he promoted a race hygiene, that's the Toxic Language Association, whose aim was to create an immediate and quite secret pathway to eugenic sterilization, this was his language, for women of color and for poor women whose existence would undermine the great American citizenry that was being built in this country. So he spent a lot of his energy and his time working on clinical, later on on chemical, and certainly on surgical ways to prevent women that came before him who were from the wrong classes from being pregnant. And of course, this included abortion, it included assisted miscarriage, and it included a, a sterilization after birth without consent. His private wealth came from not his professorship, which was modest in pay, but from the uh, private patients that he took in, in Baltimore's private clinics, who were the women of the wealthy upper classes of the city. And he also kept meticulous records of his care for them. His greatest achievement, he said, in the mid-1930s, just before the world's realization, perhaps, of the power of fascism, when he, in a sense, was, in fact, acting as a neo-fascist, was to promote more childbearing amongst the right kind of American women. And he was delighted to report that fertility had risen amongst the upper-class women of Baltimore from two to three children per woman to between five and six. He had a mini baby boom that he was taking credit for. This man's books on gynecology and obstetrics went across the whole world, published by Hopkins Press, by Harvard University Press. They ended up in libraries in Great Britain, in his uh, ancestors' home of Ireland, in South Africa, where I first read them. This was not a neutral practitioner of medicine and health. Some of his surgical skill techniques are still practiced today and are considered best practice. I am not repudiating some of the outstanding work that he did in surgical finesse. But along with Howard Kelly's understanding of the globe and of the body of women and women's embodiment came a very powerful cocktail and package deal. One of my professors at Hopkins, an anthropologist called Professor Emily Martin, who I give tribute to here, many of you will have read her work on HIV AIDS, on mental health and on other issues. She wrote a really powerful book published in Boston in the mid-1980s called The Woman in the Body. And it is an explicit comparison between China in the 80s, where she had done ethnographic work for five years in Beijing, and the city of Baltimore, just a few kilometers from here. Instead of making an argument that the one-child policy in China was the most grotesque human right violation ever on women, and that the United States was a shining example to repudiate that form of Maoism and post-Confucianism. She makes explicit comparisons between what is gained and what is lost for women in China and in the United States. Her book was very poorly received at the time by the established American medical community, and it's now considered a classic. In my view, she sets out an agenda 
for the linking together of casteism, colorism, classism, and most particularly racism and the toxic mix when women are either trafficked into producing children without their own dignity and volition or compelled, compelled to either abort, miscarry, or prevent, uh, are prevented from, in fact, being able to be fertile. She draws an arc between these two grotesque extremes, and she takes her pencil to the center of power in much of the United States, and that is the profession and the academy of medicine. The law profession in this country, you can understand better than I can, has been on all sides of this justice debate, and your Supreme Court has its own story to tell about itself right now. But the academy editions of American medicine are very quiet at the moment. <laughs> Nurses and doctors in this country know that there are very complex and subtle boundaries between pregnancy and abortion, between autonomy and dignity and grotesque harm, and they are choosing overwhelmingly to keep silent. They need to look very carefully because the rest of the world, including countries like Venezuela, Mexico, China, Central African Republic, and people like me in South Africa, who have seen that the American Medical Academy is the most powerful still in the world, we know that there is a lot of reckoning to come. And I would like to say if the doctors and nurses of this country began to speak up and articulate a position, it would mean less work for people inside of the law spaces. Mm -hmm. So as a young person in 1988, I wrote a thesis at Hopkins, and it was considered radical, and it was considered bizarre and even hysterical that I made the common thread between racism and obstetric violence in the United States and racism and obstetric violence in South Africa. And there were two professors that did not want to sign off on my thesis. An African historian of great power and repute stood by me, and I give credit to Professor Elizabeth Fee. Yeah. And I have to say that every single word of my thesis, I believe, is still standing to this day and not widely known in your own country. I hope thank that you. makes sense, Sarah. Yes, thank you so much. It, you know, it also makes sense understanding that racism didn't just start with dogs, right? Racism and its impact on sexual reproductive health rights. So here we are, there's Dobbs, but beyond Dobbs, there's these systems that are in place that enable that these structures that have been created with a racial, um, what can I say, an intentional racial outcome in terms of health. So what do we do? What's, what's next? In, in your, I know it's such a big question, but in your own capacity, in your own sphere of influence, what do you think is next to, to either mitigate or to either roll back or to educate or to enlighten or to revise structures, to rebuild structures. What do we do? I think it's important, Sarah, also to reject the siloed approach in global health. And I hope all of you can assist in, in that because we often talk about allyship, but what does that really mean? You know, I need to know that I'm a abortion provider, I'm a sex worker's human rights defender, I believe in adolescent health and non-criminalization of adolescent sexuality. I believe in, you know, uh, harm reduction in terms of drug policies. There are all of these different things that I am working on. And I need to trust that when you get into a room, you remember and know these issues as well. If you are in economy, right? If you are like you guys are le future legislators, lawmakers, how do I present or how do you take these issues that I'm talking about and present them also as your issues. Because remember, and, and I, get, I guess I have the privilege of, of clinical care. So when the patient walks in, she's not HIV, part contraception, part a mother who needs vaccination for her child, maybe someone who needs a pap smear because now there's this campaign. She's a full human. And we need to understand the context of people's lives. We need to understand the context of their illness. And that's why um, I wish 
there would be more and more and more doctors who take up human rights and look at medicine itself as a tool to defend human rights. So when you, and I've had this conversation with my, my, my colleagues, one is a neurosurgeon, you know, and I asked her, how often do you talk to your patients after spinal surgery about the fact that they can have sex, how, which positions, when can they have sex? The gynecologists, right, um, need to understand the, 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 sex, the, the, the rape, marital rape that women are experiencing, that even before six weeks postpartum, women are being raped by their husbands, right? Because that's, they just think they have a right to do that. So as an obstetrician, as a gynecologist, what kinds of conversations are you having with your patients in the antenatal period already to talk about violence? How, I mean, the, the many ways people get pregnant in the very first place have a violent history. And so I need to know that the colleagues who are working on gender-based violence and uh, national strategic plans understand and have in mind the clinical services that need to support women who are survivors of violence and what does dignity look like? Because it's impossible for all of us to be in the same room. But we then also, again, can't talk about the issues without talking about resourcing. Because the reason why global health right now is so fragmented and fractured is because of global health funding. A funder says, I will give you X amount to work on malaria. Another one says, I will give you X amount to work on malnutrition. And it's a 12-month grant. What can you do with a 12-month grant that's sustainable, that's secure, that is forward-looking? So even the nature of grant-making is a problem. But also the dependence on global health aid has a racial, also historical reason in that many of the countries that people try and save, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, I'm an African and I know and see every day how the extraction of minerals and, 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 and resources of the countries that I live in and the continent I live in has led to our own governments not having enough GDP and fiscus space to fund its own health programming. And so starts the vicious cycle of dependency in global health aid. Now, that global health aid is, an inf is being influenced by foreign policy, which is done by lawmakers. So my patients in South Africa are directly impacted by the decisions in the capital. And that makes no sense at all. And so there's no ownership of health programming in, in the national and local regions. There's no um, accountability because the data, the indicators, um, uh, and, and, and the outcomes are often driven by the agenda of the funder. So we need more participation of communities who are affected by the issues we are talking about. We need meaningful participation at all levels of decision making, not just as a token to say, oh, we did a con community consultation. And we need to change this idea who the expert is in global health. And a lot of institutions globally practice what I call parachuting, right? Um, you come to South Africa, you spend a month in the Kruger National Park, it's wonderful. <laughs> or you go to the Serengeti in Kenya, and then you come back either to London or to America, and suddenly you are the global health expert. <laughs> not me, not me, but you become the expert. And now you get to design programs and set the agenda and for the me grants. and get the grants <laughs> for me and my patients back on the African continent. There is something fundamentally wrong about that. And so even the issues of knowledge production, who, who, who owns knowledge? Who gets to be seen as an expert? All of it is racialized, it's gendered. Um, and so when you see hashtags like trust black women alongside abortionist healthcare, alongside Black Lives Matter, that's why, it's because all these issues are connected. They are connected. Um, so we need to, and you need to, in the way, the methodology of work also needs to be challenged. All of us have to interrogate what we have inherited across all the institutions, across all of the levels. And when you make a decision, think about it positionally. Am I the person who should be making this decision? Who is being impacted by this decision and what do they have to say? And I think we need to turn this whole thing really on its head if we are going to move forward in an equitable manner. And you realize I haven't mentioned the word decolonization at all, <laughs> which is a buzzword, which again has been diluted in the same way that intersectionality has been diluted. And so often I don't say those words, but I wanted to, you know, here in this space to say it so that you know why. Because we are not ready to interrogate power. 
We are not ready to be honest about where power lies within ourselves as professionals, but also the institutions. So the global health institutions broadly, but also institutions that produce scholars and knowledge. And for as long as we are not having the discussion around power, we, you can't even dare say the word decolonization. You can only be decol decolonial when you are ready to have a conversation about power and where power lies. Until that moment, none of us should be claiming any type of decolonial work whatsoever. Um, yeah. And you, Professor Goodwin, I have to ask, abortion and power, yes. can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. And, and it's been set up so uh, beautifully between both your comments. So, so let's go back a little bit further in history to really understand what this moment represents. I've been calling it the new Jane Crow to understand Jane Crow itself is to understand the brilliant work of Polly Murray, who has been invisible in history, but was the predecessor to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So if you think that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was astonishing, brilliant, amazing, a forerunner, a pathbreaker, then you really need to know Polly Murray, who was before Ruth Bader Ginsburg by a generation who left an archive at the ACLU that Ruth Bader Ginsburg could lean to, who, when she was at Howard University Law School, because law schools discriminated by race and gender, and she was able to go to Howard, how she wrote, while a law student, papers that served as the foundation for the arguments in Brown v. Board of Education, served as the foundation for what Ruth Bader Ginsburg would later pick up at the ACLU and run with, who in the early 1940s wrote a law review article about sex inequality in employment and women, this black woman, Polly Murray, who wrote about Jane Crow. And I call this period a new Jane Crow because it's important to understand the old and to understand Jim Crow and to understand American slavery and how it fits. So to go back even further than Dr. Kelly, is to understand the works of Marion Sims, who was considered in the United States to be the godfather, grandfather of gynecology, Horatio Storer, and Joseph D. Lee. And to understand that abortion was not criminalized in the United States, unlike what Justice Alito alludes to that it always had been. It's absolutely inaccurate. Indigenous women were performing abortions. People who sailed over on the Mayflower were receiving abortions. Abortion becomes a subject of criminal law at the time leading up to the Civil War. And to understand what has been talked about today in terms of knowledge, think about this. There are no, if we had to pause and think about it, there are no guys with stethoscopes and white lab coats roaming around the plains of Africa, Asia, or Europe millennia ago saying, let me look in your vagina. Your uterus. Of course not, right? I mean, that sounds provocative, but the reality is it didn't exist. Who was doing that work? Women were doing that work. It was women's work. That is what it was. The field of obstetrics and gynecology becomes a thing in the 1800s, led largely by these men who, were, who had been able to patent tools. And the experimentation was on enslaved black women. With no anesthesia. Oh, hello. Mm -hmm. Marion Sims, to read his autobiography, which I did do, lauded his, up until recently, statute in Central Park. Yeah. It's a big deal to get a statue in, in, you read his autobiography in horror. In horror. And it's interesting, who gets to sit at the table? Mm -hmm. Because on one end of the table, or the t table that had been dominant, was, it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's brilliant. Anyone going through medical school should know Marion Sims for his brilliance, let's erect another statue. I read his book and was horrified by how he described having epiphanies in the middle of the night. And when he would have an epiphany, he'd go to the back of his house and into the shack where he held enslaved and chained black women. And how he writes about it. It's his own words. It's not my words, your words, or your words. His words. Epiphany in the middle of the night, his belief that black women didn't feel pain. If they did, they didn't deserve anesthesia. And he would get out his cutting tools, his knives, and he would lacerate into their bodies 
cutting, reopening, stitching, and so forth, and to write about it. And then there were the men who read it and thought it was brilliant. Isn't this brilliant? Let's do not only a statue in Central Park, let's do one in South Carolina and other places. Let's do one in Baltimore. Because this is, this is brilliant. This is how we understand black women and their bodies, right? So when we think about this pathway leading up to where we are now, and the laws that Justice Alito refers to, mm -hmm. these criminal laws were those that were being pushed by Horatio Storr, Joseph G. Lee, the sort of new coats in gynecology, who had as a primary, two primary purposes. The first was getting rid of the women who were doing this work. And these were women who were indigenous, mm -hmm who are of African descent, who are of European descent. How beautiful, actually, that very kind of multiracial coalition of women who were doing this kind of work. And they led a campaign to create licensure requirements that was to tax women out of this kind of work. We already knew that women were being banned from medical schools. Imagine this, women who had millennia of knowledge with regard to women's bodies, if only allowed to go to medical school. Yeah and who they could have been. Imagine black women coming out of slavery with all of that knowledge, able to go to medical school and get the badge that they were denied. But to your point about the American Medical Association, the organization that they were able to lean into to build the campaign against both the midwives and to use abortion selectively, it becomes this tool, a tool for two purposes. One, this is the way we can demonize the midwife, say, oh, they're doing this horrible kind of work. But then two, and really this is the main point leading up to the Civil War, is to say, and again, in their words, we need white women to spread their loins and go north, south, east, and west. Today we hear it as replacement theory, but back then that is what they were doing. And the AMA allowed themselves to be used, the organization itself, served as a platform for that agenda. And if we don't understand that history, then we miss really understanding what this is all about, what this has been about. And so much of it has a capitalist instinct behind it, such as we want to monopolize this space. And the way that we get to monopolize it is we push all of these women out, we demonize them, and we take it for ourselves. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. And I think that links well to the issues of imperialism and white supremacy. And, you know, in a country like South Africa, for example, no one really ever cared in the apartheid government whether black women died or not. The policing of white women's bodies and incentivizing them to have more children, which were white babies, served the agenda of white domination. And so, again, abortion becomes the lens in which we use to analyze very important issues um, but also uh, uh, the, I, I can't find the English word for it, but misplaced and misused notion of, uh, you know, the white population in America is getting less and therefore we need more white people, more white women then to give birth to more white babies. So we need to look at the, the Supreme Court judgment in that context as well of imperialism and white supremacy and what it looks like for us today in 2020, 22. You see, COVID has completely collapsed time. <laughs> in 2022. What does that look like? What does that mean? And because, again, the reproductive justice movement in the U.S. is what I used to look up. A lot of women like Loretta Ross, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, I never accessed to that kind of um, information in my country. So I used to YouTube them back on, you know, when you dial in and you can hear the drr drr on your internet just to try and catch a clip something, a lecture, and I was often, you know, hoping that a student would just, you know, drop uh, something, anything that will give me content in what I knew was absolutely incredibly wrong with what I was experiencing and what I inherited as a medical doctor because I wanted to change the practice of medicine, but I'm also working against the establishment, and there's only so much you can do within because then you get pushed out, and so... How do we support doctors who are also human rights defenders who are active in this work as well? Because we know that, and, I, and it's still the medical fraternity because it's still a big boys club, right? Even us as women are still seen as you should be grateful that you made it in here. Never mind, now you're a black woman as well. Now you come here with all of these things. Just be a doctor. And so this constant call on my own colleagues and challenge to say, 
We need to inherit, what we need to interrogate. Right? Exactly. <laughs> we need to interrogate what inherited. And people ask me all the time. I and I'm also a sexual pleasure practitioner, by the way. And um with an excellent book on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> And the reason why, you know, and people ask me all the time, why, and, and, and they do, they make this mistake, OBGYN, I'm like, I'm not, please, I'm not. I'm just a general practitioner with an interest in sexual and productive health rights because I want to extract myself from that history of Marian Sims. Mm. I had a difficulty as a medical student learning gynecology because I had, a second day of medical school had met Professor Catherine Burns. So I had some of that knowledge and these names in my head. And when I started reading about them and as a senior medical student, having to practice over and over the Marian stitch, mm. I could not, I, it, I physically could not participate. And so for me, it's a, it's a personal um, uh, reflection, but also a personal story of how my own activism came about um, as a doctor. And it's so important um, that we, we teach history, that we teach, um, you know, how the, the story of how we got here. But the, the issues and that judgment is not uh, outside. It's not, happening, it's not happening in its own context in the court. It is part of the anti-rights agenda, anti-women agenda, anti-abortion, uh, obviously, um, but the rising just anti-women and anti-LGBTQI global movement. It's playing into that. And so globally as a movement, what are we doing? And we need to honestly think back to women like Pro uh, Professor Laura Charos, who've been talking about reproductive justice and saying it's not just about the ability to make a choice. Anyone can decide anything. But can you realize that right? Is it economically accessible? Is it physically accessible for a trans person or perhaps a disabled person? Is it literally accessible? So we need to talk about rights and how accessible they are. It's not enough to just legislate or make a policy. Um, and, and so the reproductive justice movement, I think for me, if people trusted black women and listened, they were seeing the warning signs were there for at least 20 years. And in the last 10 years, even with the previous administration, where there were possibilities, right, of doing particular yes. things in the Senate that were not done. Yes. There were possibilities of doing things in the Supreme Court that were not done. And so that's now history. But how do we move forward as, as people who are equal, who are not seeing themselves as saviors of other people? I want Americans to save America. <laughs> Us as Africans, we will save ourselves. Yeah. You have a lot of work to do. Focus on that. <laughs> Ah, okay. Um, you know, one of the things I, I do want to, to ask, especially an educator like you, Professor Burns, we've talked a little bit here about interrogating power, which means looking backwards, right? Where did the power structure start? Where's the root of the power structure? We've talked a little bit about the interconnectedness of human rights. We can't just look at one right and say, well, we'll protect this one, but you can't have this one. So what is it that education needs to do in order to build doctors like Dr. T, to build people like Professor Goodwin, to build people that are concerned about the interconnectedness of rights and the way in which people need to be intersectional in the approach to their work? Gosh, people in the room will be able to answer this all with their own thoughts and voices. So maybe I'm touching on some souls when I say this. One of the most important things in any form of reading of the past, whether it's reading through oral listening or through texts, is an archaeology approach. We are always standing on the shoulders of giants, and we've heard of more today. It is ludicrous to present the world in the form of capital E education as if some reception that is recent existed sui generis. Every single form of power in the world has its roots in something that can be described and needs to be analyzed. So if we look around the world and we see people with more and less power, to attribute capacity and reason and authenticity to uh, the result of thousands of different acts as if they are God-given or natural. It's a, it's a sort of performance of a kind of willful ignorance that happens over and over. And whenever we see that accumulating, then a form of ideology is emerging that demands attention. 
So, for example, it is not disrespectful to the United States Medical Academy to call into question its understanding of itself when it proposes to the world that it knows the heart, the pelvis, the vulva, the brain better than any other space on earth. These days, it's impossible for the United States to make that claim in a way that was casually made 30 years ago. Soon, this will not have the world, the world's biggest economy will not be here. It's no longer considered the world's most democratic state. It's no longer considered a place of great safety for the people of the world. And 50 years from now, we can only hope that the slide is arrested by the people in this room. The golden thread that I'd like to draw is about the South in the North. You've called it Jane Crow. We can, there are many names for this. People speak about apartheid America. Mm -hmm. A professor that you know at a university right near here, uh, Professor Washington, has written a book called Apartheid Health in the United States at Harvard. Perhaps you will be taking a class with her, Nushka. In this society that you live in, laws were passed that then get referred to, and I'm coming back to Golden Thread, what Laleng started off with, that get referred to in Supreme Courts and in constitution-making legislatures all over the African continent. To this day, jurists in Kenya and Tanzania and Ghana and Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Botswana and Namibia and even in South African courts constantly reference American courts and American expertise. This is why... I come here to your country, not to present some form of farcical gesture of um, uh, sort of radical repudiation, but to say we are in this together. The only silver lining of this Dobbs decision, and I think you referred to it to uh, Michelle, is that it compels us to do this archaeology. My problems and my society's struggles are your struggles. And they're the struggles of people all over the world. We cannot have one house that has closed its doors to another and help to change this seismic moment. And of course, we haven't mentioned climate change today. But across this planet, our oxygen and our water and our harmful carbons are deeply affected the bodies and the life forces of the planet and of the animals and creatures here. Please let us approach these topics with humility. Let us approach these topics with solidarity and comradeship. Let us forswear any form of ideology which sets one group of people against another. And every single one of us in this room was born from the complex forces that came together, that have historical, genetic, and epigenetic roots. It is imperative that this Dobbs moment is looked at as a global threat and not a parochial threat to people in the United States. It will happen in a court in South Africa soon that Dobbs will be referenced. And despite our powerful constitution, which guarantees us rights that you are not guaranteed in law, we will find ourselves struggling because money is pouring in to Southern Africa right now to try and take away access to abortion rights from people in this city and cities near here. We can help you with your struggles and you can help us. So that is a long answer to your question, Sarah. An archaeology of knowledge is the root of all education. Thank you so much for that response. Thank you so much. Um, I want to give enough time. I, I can feel the questions vibrating from the audience. So I want to give enough time for people to be able to ask questions, and then I'll allow the panelists to each just give five minutes of sort of concluding. Of course, there is no real conclusion, right? The work is just beginning, but certainly concluding thoughts to this particular conversation. So if you have a question, um, I think our team will help us, right, with microphones. Uh, so try and keep your question as short as possible. We'll take three, and then the panelists, you can feel free to respond to whichever question. And we'll, we'll start first here, and then there's also another hand in the back. We'll just wait for a mic. And, and... Okay, project really well. <laughs> 
I think Sarah was targeting me when she said keep the questions short. <laughs> <laughs> For purposes of this conversation, I'm a law student at Georgetown uh, doing my LLM on national and global health. And my question particularly to, I need to get your title and name right, Professor Michelle Godwin, and also to Catherine Barnes. Uh, in one of our readings in class uh, around the right to privacy in healthcare, one of our professors, Professor Gita, referred us to an article by a lady called Becky Little on how the Nazis were inspired by Jim Crow practices, and I found it to be troubling because the picture I had of, not that I feel anything right about what the Nazis did, but to learn that they were inspired by the laws that were done in this country, and to speak to my colleagues who studied in the US and say the history they are taught does not bring that out. My question then to both you and Dr. And Dr. Catherine Barnes is, who then gets to write the right history mm -hmm. that makes us realize what went wrong and how do we get there? So some guidance on that would be greatly appreciated. And Alan, if you could pass the mic, someone had a hand up in the back, please just grab the mic. I am Eunice Nafi Mustafa from Sierra Leone, West Africa. I love your energy, Dr. Tim. <laughs> So based on what you've said and based on my own personal experiences, our voices have been crippled by aid and our stories have been told from foreign perspectives. So what I want to know, Dr. T, is how can we break the vicious circle of global aid and how can we champion our own narrative and be at the center of decision making? An Africa of experts that will speak on behalf of Africa. Uh, are there any more questions before we let... Okay, there's one question up front here. Hello. Thank you so much for this um, excellent panel. I mean, it's been exceptional. I think we all can agree on that. Um, I just wanted to talk about... Uh, I have a question about intersectionality. So I think you asked Sarah, um, Dr. Burns, about how do we kind of practice intersectionality or how do we teach intersectionality? And my question is more about practice. Um, you know, one of the goals of the commission is to have an intersectional approach to exploring racism in health and health um, and structural discrimination as well. But like our day-to-day -day jobs, like I'm an epidemiologist, Dr. T is a clinician, you're a lawyer, historian, lawyer. And we don't really get to intersect that much. And so I'm wondering, like, are there examples of spaces, like I'm, I'm thinking maybe in the advocacy space, where these different fields come together and are able to push, like, uh, global health law, uh, global health practices and policy, like in my sphere, from an intersectional informed, I'm sorry, my back is to you, from an intersectional informed way. So that's okay, we'll stop at those three. Uh, I'll let the panelists respond, and then we'll take three more questions. Uh, feel free to start, whoever feels ready so, to go. I'll, I'll start. Thank you so much, Ellen, for that question as to who gets to write history. Um, just weeks ago, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson joined the United States Supreme Court. In two, over 230 years, there was no black woman on our Supreme Court. So she's the first black woman in over 233 years to serve on our court. Your question is really important. When I think about not only the case, but the bell that you reference, 1927, the United States Supreme Court gave its imprimatur to a Virginia law that provided for the compulsory sterilization of people who were considered to be unfit. The Supreme Court could have done differently. But the Supreme Court, in what was really um, uh, it was a test case, it was a case to sort of test this law. Carrie's lawyer in that case was a eugenic sympathizer. So it wasn't even as if she really had a lawyer that was really going to take on the challenge. But notably in that case, the Chief Justice, who's a revered jurist, said three generations of imbeciles are enough. Better than to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. He said the laws that were broad enough to impose inoculation 
or broad enough to cover, quote, cutting the fallopian tubes. The Nazis picked that up. And in Nuremberg, when a former United States, former United States Supreme Court justice went and led the charge against the Nazi doctors, the leading defense that they had is that we were doing nothing differently than what you were practicing in the United States. It's profound. It really is. And to dive in even more deeply in terms of who gets to be on record in terms of making history being in these rooms. It's the United States Supreme Court that blocked women from even being able to become attorneys. So when we sort of think about where we are, the rhetoric is women weren't smart enough, rational enough, etc. But when you look at it, it's the Supreme Court and legislatures led by men, and it happened to be white men who said no, right? Um, so case Bradwell v. Illinois, where a woman wanted to practice law with her husband. So it really is unpacking what these roots are such that we can understand them. It's a great question, which seems more of a reflection. And I'll just close with this. These are issues that still hit home. When I began law teaching, I was the only black person at all on the faculty that I joined. And I didn't join a faculty 50 years ago. This is just over 20 years ago. And then I did the work to try to help recruit other people. So when we think about the spaces that we come into, we try to make them better. But that's all the more work that we are doing while others are able to do other things. We're sort of doing those other things, but at the same time, we're trying to make space for other people. And we're trying to translate why it's important to people who do not understand and recognize their implicit and their explicit biases, which have led them to try to shut the door every time a person of color has wanted to open it and be in company with them. Well, that is such a powerful answer to your question. I do not want to add anything of substance, but in a way, a bibliography, a living bibliography. Let us continue to use spaces that you've opened here you're a visitor here for the next couple of months, I believe. Let us share resources and readings constantly in this febrile and important epistolary network that we can use the social media and the clouds for. Let us not use the World Wide Web to consume only things. Let us voraciously eat each other's words. A fantastic and powerful book that I read in 1992, Mothers of the Fatherland, about women in the Third Reich, that draws on all the examples you've given, should be mandatory reading, in my view. The powerful book by Jacqueline Jones, Labor of Love, <coughs> Labor of Sorrow, about the natal histories of women in Washington and Baltimore counties along this Potomac River, I have resources from Southern Africa that I've developed, written, co-written, found. You have resources from the societies and regions of the United States or wherever you come from, Barbados, that you've drawn on. Let us constantly build some kind of a palace that is taking us away from the swamps. And let us have the courage to understand that we are on this planet together, and that our mutual forms of knowledge are weaponized so often against each other that it will take the energy of everyone in this room and the resources of everyone in this room to create these sticky pathways. Can I pick up on the vaccine point? One of the reasons across the world that there is vaccine hesitancy it's not only a force field created by the man whose surname begins with a T and ends with a P. <laughs> One of the reasons that many people in the world and in the global south and in the south of your north are frightened of vaccines is because of the way that vaccines have been weaponized. People have been given vaccines that are inferior. People have been given tuberculosis treatment that's out of date. People have been subjected to regimes of so-called sanitation syndrome, sanitation cordeurs, uh, pandemics have been used to police people and to remove people's jurisprudence and their de jure rights. Understanding that doesn't make you some kind of a fellow traveler 
with the anti-science community. It makes you an effective, subtle thinker and a person of solidarity in the world. And it repudiates the narrow ideologies that seek to own that history for different ends. I just wanted to pick up on your vaccine point too, please. Um, yeah, so the issue of breaking the cycle of aid is very difficult because it's a political issue more than a financial issue. Um, and again, in the context of imperialism, it's very hard um, because, and I, and I have this criticism all the time in my own context um, back home to say, we need more and more black people with the resources to actually support the work of human rights defenders as well. Because there are people who are creating an environment that's conducive for you to be in business, for you to have employment equity, for all of these uh, uh, you know, things to happen. And so how do we also then also get ourselves to support our own work? Because I think that will go a long way. There are some you know, ideas right now about feminist uh, grant making. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. So that's something interesting to read about, um, uh, you know, and I've experienced it from different um, angles. And the other thing is, I think, you know, we need transparency. Again, going on the COVID vaccine example, that so many areas around the world, in fact, all of them, there isn't a nation in the world that has been transparent in terms of how much they procured the vaccine for. Um, and of course, we know this around the science around vaccine, which, by the way, is a human right, right? Everyone has a human right to benefit from scientific knowledge is that um, without the information, there can never be accountability. Because civil society, all of those people, we need the information. And so the secrecy behind it and, and the lack of transparency limits um, what we can do in terms of accountability and participation. I think also, just to let you know, there are other, for example, UN special repertoires who are going to elicit money flows and um, uh, debt, international debt, foreign debt. And um, Professor Tia Waris, she's also one of our commissioners on the newly announced commission. And she does, uh, she has a very interest in, in, in health funding and financing. And she's a professor of fiscal law. So it's about how do we intersect the issues. For example, I'm working on an, a special report on the right to health and her. There's also the working group on business and human rights. And I know the O'Neill Institute, I've worked with Isabel and Oscar a lot. And often we talk about commercial determinants of health and the issues we've done in terms of holding industry accountable um, for the health outcomes that we are seeing. And so it also, again, becomes very tricky. We, we criticizing business on the one hand, but on the other hand, you have communities who are depending on the corporate uh, social responsibility initiatives of these very corporates. So how do we then hold our own government accountable for corruption, maladministration, and, and, and um, uh, you know, f f fruitless expenditure? So the kinds of leaders we elect into government is also very important. So we don't have a choice but to be political players ourselves. We cannot just leave things that are very political um, to people who have no idea of what the lived reality is. And I think Stacey Abrahams is one example of what that can look like um, to go from, I'm in a community, here's X problem, to a leader and an active player in the political arena. It's not without risks. I respond a lot of the times to a lot of human rights defended who are, defenders who have forcefully disappeared. Some, we still don't know where they are. A, you know, young women who are protesting in their own country in terms of modesty and how they dress, you know, some have been killed. So there's a real cost and a consequence to activism. So again, you know, when you draw up programs in DC, in New York, about empowering African women, we don't even need empowerment. We need safety and security in our own countries to be able to act advocacy. But if your money comes with the clauses that we can't advocate, how then will we fight for our own future? So it's all of it is linked. Moving on to the supporting voices. I mean, I'm a social media and I believe in social media. I'm a producer and consumer <laughs> of, <laughs> of pop culture as well. But I'm very intentional um, in, in what I share, how I share it. And if there's ever a campaign, you can always either tag me, let me know in advance. I'm always happy to help um, with that. And I think our ways of protesting also have to be different. Bodies on the line, it's very difficult. We know the issues of police brutality. Um, June, no, January 6th happened. Mm. There were no black people there. That's why there was no tear gas. That's why there were no yeah. grenades. That's why that whole thing went on for the many hours it did, right? Had that been a Black Lives Matter protest on those steps, we'd be talking a very different thing. So when you then say, let's go and fight, and let's, whose body's on the line? And so the, your allyship needs to stop being a self, 
determined tag and thinking about being a co-conspirator and the question is what are you bringing put some skin in the game then we can start talking um, but otherwise i think our collective power is really really important in how we advocate i need to know that the people in hr understand the importance of a juve day what we call juve day and menstrual leave Right. And the fact that as a woman, I've probably used all of my annual leave, taking care of my own children, my extended family and my in-laws as well. So when will I go for that pap smear screening? When will I go back for the results if it takes me two days just to get the pap smear? So when you say black women are dying more of cervical cancer, those women don't need more empowerment. They need systems and workplaces that understand how and why they put themselves last and why they cannot go back for oncology treatment because they have low paying jobs and she has no sick leave. So she will, despite knowing everything, make a decision that's going to give her family livelihood as opposed to her own health. So that's exactly intersectionality, just to answer Ngozi's question, yeah. And we must value dialogue for the sake of dialogue. I think thought leadership, thought production is very important. Often we speak for an agenda. We have an outcome. I think we just need to talk for the sake of talking and connecting with each other. That is so valuable. No agenda. We, we don't need to come up with the uh, recommendations. And just Can we just talk for the sake of talking and realize how organized the other movement is that is anti our rights? And so you cannot be a human rights defender that's picking and choosing, or oh, I'm a human rights defender, but I don't think people should have abortions. Oh, but I don't think sex workers. Then you are not a human rights defender. Right. So we need to, to, to define for ourselves what those look like, but also the language. Our language we use has been stolen mm -hmm. by the other side. They're talking about radical this. They're talking about autonomy in very weird ways. <laughs> what are we doing? What kind of how, how are we progressing? How are we developing language? How are we making sure that they stop stealing our language? But if we are in silence, just watching ourselves so concerned about looking respectable and, and, and sophisticated, we're not going to get far. The other side, they're not, they're not uh, uh, obsessed with looking <laughs> composed and sophisticated. and they, they are in it. They are in it for the big game. And so we need to show up with that type of energy. And for as long as we're playing around respectability politics and class, and we, we won't get where we need to. But collective action is really what's important. Thank you so much. Um, because of our time, there will be opportunity to mingle with our speakers uh, for a reception. I'm going to ask each of you to give just a really short, what do you want the people that have attended to walk away with? If it's one sentence, what is the impactful thing you want them to walk away with? I've already walked away with, we can talk without having to come up with recommendations. Coming from a civil society background, it's like if we don't have recommendations or a 10-point action plan or something, we haven't done anything. So that's one thing I've walked away with. So, you know, what would the speakers like the audience to walk away with? We have so much to learn from each other. I'm hoping for a third reconstruction here, and in that third reconstruction, one where we center the lives of women and girls and people who are LGBTQ individuals with disabilities, and that we hold on to it, don't become vulnerable to the forces that have always caused us to slip back. And I'd also like to say, if you'd like to continue this conversation, on Friday, we're having a panel discussion uh, that's entitled The Arc of Reproductive Justice Post Dobbs. And it's going to be from 3 to 4.30 with a reception following. So to continue the conversation. Love it. Can I stay? <laughs> <laughs> so mine is just really simple, is that I think we all need to commit to creating a conducive environment and societies that enable a life of dignity for all people. Ultimately, that's what it is. And I've dedicated my tenure, a special repertoire, to that, to the idea of restoration of people's dignity. And because I don't know what dignity looks like for you, it forces me to engage communities and people whom I'm writing about in my reports, whom I'm, uh, I'm reporting on whose behalf, what dignity looks like for them. So I hope that when you read my reports, you can get a sense of where you are in the world and what the potentials are for you to engage, to support, and to keep fighting. Um, and, and I hope one day you can 
boldly identify as a human rights defender, but at the center of that should be the restoration of people's dignity, and therefore we need to engage people about what that looks like for them. Thank you so much to our speakers. So the takeaway is a life of dignity is important. We should center the groups that we've always forgotten, and we shouldn't be swayed once we've centered those groups, and we should listen to each other. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.